I am hunting for the perfect pair of shoes and who better to give me a little bit of assistance than the CEO of one of India's largest footwear as well as accessories retailers that is Metro Brands and I have with me none other than Mr. Nissan Joseph. Thank you so much for taking time out. We'll get to the shoe selection a bit later maybe but I want to talk about the business because we're right here in one of the stores in Phoenix Market City and uh, you know there's actually a brokerage note that begins by talking about a quote from Bruce Lee about Metro Brands saying that you have to create your own luck, you have to look at opportunities around you and grab it and that's what Metro Brands has done. Do you agree? Well, good morning, Avan, and thank you for having me here. I think, um, yes, luck is where opportunity meets preparation, right. as you know, and so I think at Metro Brands over its last 70 years has shown a lot of operational rigor and financial discipline that has enabled them to really come through you know, the ups and downs of retailing that's very typical in an Indian retail landscape. And, you know, it's taken a lot of discipline to stay focused, to maximize and capitalize on that luck. And, you know, there's a number of brands when it comes to Metro. Of course, you have the Metro brand, and then there's Mochi, Da Vinci, and then, of course, the third-party ones like Crocs and Skechers, etc. So, customers are surely spoiled for choice. But I want to understand what is the contribution from some of the in-house brands versus what you get from the third party and what the breakup is going to be like going forward? So primarily we have three in-house concepts, which is Metro Mochi and Walkway. Right. Metro and Mochi is a little bit more uh, premium and Walkway is definitely for the value consumer. Mm -hmm. Inside those concepts, we do have some of our own brands, such as Da Vinci and Jay Fontini and things like that. So right. all those brands combined together in our portfolio add up to about 70% of our sales. The in-house. The in-house brands, right. right? So whether it's a Metro branded shoe or a Da Vinci branded shoe, mm -hmm. it adds up to about 70. Now we do get 30% of it from the outside brands, mm -hmm. such as Crocs and Fit Flop and Skechers, and that's primarily because we want to enhance the consumer journey in our stores. Right. We want them to have a complete journey. We want them to have product that's unique and differentiates us from the rest of uh, you know, the crowd. Right. Um, so let's understand financials as well because it's been great. You, you have reason to smile yeah. actually. A 26% sequential growth in the revenues and then you had margins and even your gross margins at an all-time high. Do you think that these levels look sustainable? Are there any internal targets in mind? Right. So when, if you look at the history of Metro Brands, and let's just go over the last 10 years, right? Mm -hmm. Our CAGR of growth over the last 10 years was roughly about 18%. Our profitability has grown in line with that. Our margins, our gross margins have stayed in the 55 to 57% range. As we look to the future, you know, those are the numbers that we want to anchor to. Not because we think that's the best we can do, but at the same time, we don't want to miss opportunities mm -hmm. because you got gross margins too high and you're missing out on the, uh, on the price and demand curve. So we, 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 we tend to be conservative when it comes to that. We know we have a good model. It's not like we got to blow up our gross margins or blow up our, our, our uh, bring down operating costs dramatically. It's about keeping that financial discipline, that operational rigor going, a consistent business, and that's how we want to run. So, you know, I think we're, all the numbers that we showed uh, are pretty much in the range of what we would expect. So that's what you're targeting as well going forward? Any particular numbers in terms of gross margins or your EBITDA margins? Right, so our EBITDA is always run in about the 30% range, which is where we're comfortable with that. Okay. Our PAT runs in the mid-teens, which is a very healthy number. And then, of course, gross margins, like I said, you know, we'd always target between 55 and 57. Sometimes we're going to see it blip up and go up to 59% like it did last quarter. But I think on an average, we target 55 to 57, and we plan our business accordingly, Avan. And, you know, I'm glad you brought up that last quarter margin because I was going to ask if it was, you know, the fact that there was a bit of hedging done in terms of inventory, the raw material benefit that you saw the last time around that may not be seen in the coming quarters? Right. So I think uh, some, a couple of things helped us. One is we did hedge on some inventory anticipating some, uh, some absolute uh, price input spikes. And one of the things you do, what you're able to do when you have inventory is you don't have to react to every spike in the market. So that's enabled us to keep our prices steady, but of course we had built in some buffer in there. So we didn't take prices as much as we thought we would, so we benefited from it. But I think what it really says is the product that we did invest in was one that the consumer appreciated because they did buy it. It's not like they still looked yeah. at it and said, you know what, that's not the right price, we're not going to buy it. So I think that speaks well to our buying team, our merchandising team back uh, in our office that says we know how to pick that product and price it. And I think India is going to see that inflation. It's not like we've never seen inflation. So uh, I think we're very much in, it's an indication that we're very much in touch with our consumer. I want to come to pricing a bit later, but I think a great stamp of approval is the fact that the, uh, you know, the late ACE investor, Rakesh Junjunwala, 
nearly 100x his money on the investment in metro brands that must feel absolutely validating right well i think um, i think it's more validating for us that he was part of us um, one of the things that the entire rare organization has to bring has brought to the table is a discipline is a financial accountability and a certain amount of process that we would not have had had we stayed a fully private company. Right. So having uh, having rare enterprises under Rakesh Jinjinwala invest in us was equally good for us yeah. as, as I'm sure it was for the 100x uh, return plus that he yeah. received. But you know it was a very symbiotic relationship where we depended on rare to give us that guidance, give us that compliance, give us that overall statutory point of view and investment point of view. Uh, while we were busy running our business. So it was an amazing relationship. I was very fortunate to have spent an evening with uh, Rakesh, uh, Rakesh Ji at, at, a, at a venue. And, you know, the guy's amazing. Uh, uh, he exudes that aura. The exudes yeah. of the aura of absolute, you know, uh, one brashness on one side and yeah. one sheer intelligence and genius on the other side. Yeah, so, and you said one of the highlights was you received an SMS as well from him congratulating you. Can you tell us a little bit about a few encounters maybe that you've had with him and what that felt like? Right, right. so I've had uh, three encounters with him. Okay. One of them was a social encounter, which was absolutely fun. The guy is absolutely nuts and full <laughs> of energy. Uh, the second one was through one of our strategy meetings where he sits down and listens to your entire strategy and then just picks apart the two or three th key things that you need to focus on and you just go, wait, you were listening well, to that so whole thing. So what kind of advice was it? Well, you know, it's strategic so we don't want to ah, divulge sure, it, but sure, it sure. always is amazing yeah. that he was able to pick out the crux of what not only the strategy is, but also equally what is the, the part that might derail it, right? Yeah. So that was the second thing. And of course, after we reported our Q numbers, uh, I think it was early in the morning at home and, and you know your phone WhatsApp dings and all of a sudden you see that, oh my gosh, it's Rakesh Jinjinwala sending you a text and it's like, I was just thoroughly knew my number. Right. Well. Let alone to get a text from there. So that was great. That was that's something that I will cherish. Uh, for sure, very validating. Um, and now when it comes to store editions, of course, there's a strategy that you have in mind. It starts with, uh, you know, Metro and, and Mochi and mm -hmm. so on. What's the current uh, store count and the store edition plan? Right. So we closed last quarter with uh, 644 stores. What, what is exciting to see this now is that we're growing across all our concepts. So we're opening metros, mochis, walkways. For a while there, we were a little focused on opening Crocs. Right. Now we've made that focus to all of our concepts. So we continue to grow all those chains. We hope, we, we're pretty confident we can open 260 stores in the three years from when we pu publicly listed. And that's actually across all our concepts. But it's also exciting because it is across all tiers of cities in India. We right. think there's a lot of opportunity for us to continue our penetration into the Indian market. And there's been a digital strategy as well, the omni-channel yeah. strategy that the company has adopted. But I think that as of now, it's a very small part of the revenue by the digital contribution. Correct. Are you looking to scale that up? Are you looking to increase that now? Right, so I think uh, digital is a very unique uh, piece of our business. We're very committed to it, that's number one. Right. Right? So it's not like we're not making investments. Uh, you know, we've seen over 79% CAGR growth over the last three years just in our digital business. Mm -hmm. But it's also a tricky business. You don't want it to become a discount-led business. You don't want it to become a business where people are just looking for deals, right? And balancing that is a tricky act. I've always said, Avon, if I wanted to do 25% in digital tomorrow, I could. Yeah. But I may not have a brand two years from now. It's about maintaining that balance between meeting consumer demand, meeting consumer expectations, giving them uh, interesting concepts, getting to tier three and tier four cities where you may not have a store, at the same time maintaining a brand salience. Right, that's the key focal point. And when it comes to the pricing, I said I'd come to it. So um, I understand that um, the average price is at about, average sales price is close to 1,500 rupees. Now, I'm just comparing to the other listed players. Compared to Bata, say about 650, 750 rupees, or a Relaxo, uh, even less than that. Right. Is that affecting sales volumes at all? Oh, well, so <laughs> obviously not. But right. uh, you know, if you look at our productivity per square foot in a mm -hmm. store, uh, it's one of the highest uh, okay. in our industry. So it, it, it obviously is not affecting it from a productivity standpoint. What it is showing is we cater to a different consumer than a lot of the other competitors do. We cater to consumers that are looking for mid to premium products. Right. They're aspiring to buy brands. They're aspiring to move up the quality chain or the value chain, whatever it might be. So we're catering to a little bit more of a premium customer. So I think that's very exciting for us.
Yes, indeed it is. And, um, you know, even in terms of the pricing, uh, it's, it's obvious that you're talking about that mid to high tier. And it seems that when the inflation came, you know, with the price point of, say, 3,000 rupees and above, those at the higher end weren't that impacted by inflation. So would you say that that price range does better comparatively? Is there a particular price range that does well for you? Well, you know, um, the price range that did grow considerably was over 3,000 rupees yeah. uh, in our last quarter. And I think that's a reflection of the premiumization of India, right. first and foremost, right? I think people want uh, a more premium c product. Their, their middle incomes are rising, so they are much more willing and aspiring to buy better products. That is a great price point for us. That might be a little bit more of our sweet spot pricing. Not that it's all of our products, okay. right? Our average is 1600, right? right. Okay. So that brings, there are things that bring it down to 16. But I think that's where it creates our brand uniqueness as Metro okay. and Mochi is, is that price point that right. we cater to very well. And now one of the concerns is, of course, growing competition. I mean, from unorganized, from organized players, there's a lot of online competition as well. Are you worried? I worry about everything uh, <laughs> because I get paid to. <laughs> but on the flip side, I think I feel confident that yeah. we're aware of a lot of those, uh, uh, those uh, headwinds that might happen. We're aware of a lot of what they're doing. We also know some people are doing some great things. So it's not like everyone's not doing it good. But we also know what we're doing is absolutely wonderful. Right. What we are doing is absolutely focused on our consumer, focused on our mission. You know, our vision of Ahn is to be India's largest specialty footwear retailer. And I think all those words are very important. We're very focused on growing in India. We're very focused on being footwear-led. And we're very focused on being a retailer. We're not going to go after vanity metrics. We're okay. not going to try and do this or that. Right. I don't have a store in Connaught Place. It doesn't bother me. Right. If the metrics don't work, we're not going to do it. And I think that kind of laser focus, that kind of discipline, yeah. is going to protect most companies mm -hmm. from competitive people and, and create a moat that is more sustainable and defensible over a period of time yeah. than just one or two things. It's a series of things. And that focus and, and your niche is what the company was going to really focus right. on. Yeah. So, um, you know, which just brings me to one of the other follow-up questions because online, there's, there's today a lot of competition online. Does that uh, in any way sort of challenge the pricing part? Do you rethink the pricing when you look at the competitive pricing online? Yeah. Well, you know, you can look at it two ways, right? Sometimes. Okay online validates the price. Right. So if you go online and you see something does really cost 3500 and you see it at 3500 in the store, then you say, okay, that's a validated price, right. right? Of course, if you see it on discount, you would understand it. The consumers are pretty savvy. They right. say, okay, this was a 3500 but it's discounted to 2000 They don't expect to see that all the time. They expect mm -hmm. that to be a deal. Uh, we think uh, it actually enhanced, what's happened is, Online used to be a discount-led model when it first started. You know, it was a last man standing, uh, all-out battle by the e-commerce by the e players. Yeah. But today, I think it's more of a, a planned business. We see some great fashion portals out there trying to really establish brands. So we feel it, it's additive and right. incremental to what we're doing today. It used to be very cannibalistic to our business. That's why we didn't get involved in it initially. So Yeah. Okay. And um, just going forward, I want to understand, would there be any concerns uh, when it comes to uh, the store rollout plan in terms of a delay in that? No, so we're in 145 odd cities yeah. today, Avon. Yeah. When I look at the landscape, there's easily 300 cities we can be in. I also look at that landscape and I say, there's a lot of cities that we're in that we may only have a metro. Mm -hmm. We may only have a mochi. How can, you know, we can go and backfill those cities. So between the backfill of cities mm -hmm. and the, the, in, the uh, penetration into new cities, we're relatively confident that the 260 is more than easily achievable. And we're also confident because we now we have five concepts to do it with, not just one. We're not banking on one pony to carry us through that wa yeah. river, right? So. Right. And for the walkway brand as well, enjoy strong financial metrics. Would you look at the wholesale route ever? So that's not our sweet spot today. Okay. And you know, I, again, I say focus is everything in retail. Mm -hmm. Focus is everything in any business. But we're very focused. India's largest specialty footwear retailer. Right. All those three s bits of sentences are everything we do. We're very focused. Now, if we look at the contribution that you're getting from tier one uh, cities and metro cities, um, that seems to be reducing a bit. And the focus on tier two and three, that's increasing a lot. Is there any key strategy that you'd look to penetrate a lot more into these smaller cities and towns? Right. So I don't think it's a strategy of penetrating into those cities. <laughs> it's, a, it's a matter of, uh, you know, we're well penetrated into our metro cities and tier one cities, yes. as you would know. Yeah. So that leaves opportunities more often in the tier two and tier three space. But I think what's been encouraging is that 
When we've gone into tier two and tier three cities, Yvonne, we've found that our business metrics mm -hmm. run about the same as a tier one city, right? Simply because you, know, you don't have 19 stores in a, in, a, in a tier three city, you might have one or two local competitors. So right. that's been a big advantage to us to find that the metrics don't get diluted right. when we go to tier, and tier two and tier three city. Consequently, you're gonna, on paper, see tier two and tier three gain more share, but it's really a matter of metrics of opening in more tier three cities, being well penetrated. You know, when we first started our business, we started out in the West. 100% okay. of our stores were in the West. Today, only 30% is. Was it a strategy to open elsewhere? No, it was well, the yeah. penetration was right. high. You know, you're going to dilute somewhere to grow right. one. So, Well, we're in September already, the festive season, the wedding season. That's down the line. And that always, of course, would do very well for a consumption-focused business like yours. So is there anything that you're expecting by way of bump up in sales during this period? Or what traditionally does it look like? Right. So I think we're optimistic about this coming upcoming uh, wedding season. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the takeaway for me was our most recent festival, we had a couple of our employees come back to the office and say, you know, they're tired because they're out partying with friends <laughs> and family. But they said it was wonderful to be with friends and family again after two long years for the most part. You know, that sentiment is still there in India today. We're gonna take advantage of every opportunity that we can be together with family and friends and celebrate. Yeah. And I think that bodes well for us on the festive season coming up. And I think there's still a backlog of weddings that had to be done or consummate, you know, get done yeah. in, a, in, a, in a ceremony. So that's still gonna happen. Yeah, I, I can't wait to dress up and just go out there and... You go. <laughs> you know, be back at weddings and things. Uh, but let's talk about globally where India stands in terms of the footwear market, because I understand that we're number two in terms of the footwear production on a unit pair basis. Correct. Where does India stand compared to the rest of the globe, the likes of China, Japan, and the United States? So just broadly speaking, the U.S. leads the way, but in yeah. terms of total pairs, it is China. Yeah. You know, in per capita, it's, it's the U.S. I think it's an eight. The U.S. is at eight. Right. Uh, units per capita of consumption. We in India aren't even at two, mm. just to give you a perspective on an average, right? And to put it more in perspective, we're less than Pakistan. Pakistan has at right a little over two, we're wow. under two. So while we sell a lot, of, while we make a lot make, of footwear yeah. and we ship Produce. out a lot of footwear, which is great, which is a great way to start because it helps the economy first sure. and foremost, uh, we also have uh, a huge opportunity to take this forward and go forward with it in the in the future. And as people's incomes rise, you know, I mean, it used to be you used to labor in the fields with agriculture. You know, today's becoming a little bit more of an industrial economy. You could very easily invest in a scooter and become a delivery person. There's only 50,000 of them running around yeah. today, right? <laughs> they need shoes. Right. They could work yeah. in the fields without shoes, yeah. but they can't work on, this, on, on a scooter without shoes. So we see a lot of people coming in. Yeah. The other thing we see actually is, uh, you know, the unorganized market is actually not going to grow as fast as the organized market. Yeah. Not because the unorganized is not a good market, and, and you know, I, one of our directors calls it the, the modernized versus unmodernized, because they're very organized, right. <laughs> if you look at the, the unorganized market. So let's yeah. look at the unmodernized uh, retail. Yeah. It's not that they're not doing a good job, they're doing a great job, mm -hmm. but a lot of times consumers prefer shopping in nice small environments, on a convenient street, and that's opening up more and more. As high streets become vibrant, tier yeah. three cities become vibrant, there's gonna be more and more opportunities for stores to come, organized retail to come into play. What is the current, uh, you know, in terms of GST for, for footwear and is there any appeal to the government on that front in terms of the taxation? Yeah, so the GST on footwear is twofold. Uh, up to 1,000 it is 12% yeah, yeah. and 12,000 onwards it's 18%. You know, these are, these are costs that we're happy to contribute to because right. we think it helps the overall economy when, you, when you're able to support governmental income, it also comes out on the back end. Right. I think the, the, the issue we have is the, the lack of parity with apparel. That's always been an issue with, with us because I, th I believe they're at five and 12, mm -hmm. and that's the lack of parity. And you know, we believe we should be treated as well. If you look at how well our um, exports in apparel have grown, mm -hmm. you know, and the consumption of apparel has grown, we believe that we can have that same kind of growth, right. both domestically and internationally. Not that international is driven by sure. GST, but I think domestic can be driven even harder if we were to lower our GST rates and bought it in parity with apparel. You know, a lot of analysts as well laud the company for their cost control measures, their focus on profitability metrics. It's something that Metro Brands has done quite well. Will that, uh, what have been some of the cost cutting initiatives that the company has taken, especially during that lull with the pandemic? Correct. And will that focus continue? So I, th I think, you know, we really have to thank our, our, our promoter family, you know, uh, Rafiq and Farah for the strong discipline. Right. Uh, 
through the pandemic period. You know, the focus was not to uh, cover down and hide. It was, you know, let's navigate through these rocky waters. Right. And what they did was they look at, you know, costs they could cut out of the business, variable costs they could leverage. Uh, what can we trim down on? How can we protect our capital investments? So there was a lot of different steps taken. But overall, I think it was a reflection of the deep financial rigor that the promoters have bought into this company many, many years ago and still continues today. So it wasn't just a one-trick pony, but that financial rigor really continues on a daily basis. Everything we do is evaluated very carefully, very, very conservatively, but with an eye to an opportunity side of it as well. Okay. Well, speaking of financial vigor, we're in a store at present. So what about the overall rental income? What is the contribution in terms of your fixed costs for the company? Um, so... I'm not sure I understand exactly the question, but our rents run, you know, yeah. some, in terms of the contribution, somewhere in the uh, mid double uh, digit percentage, right? Okay. Is our yeah. rentals Rent. for most stores? Some are a little bit higher, some are a little bit lower. Um, you know, the bottom line is we want all our stores to be profitable on day one. Okay. Right. So uh, our chairman Rafiq says there's there's no gestation period in retail. If you think you're going to get profitable in year two or three. Why would you think yeah. that? A store has to be profitable from year one, year one, and it has to be cash positive from year two. On the, after the second year, we want all our uh, investment in CapEx to be returned yeah. in cash, right? And which helps us become a very strong free cash flow company as well. And um, is there any worry that given that you have so many brands in-house as well as a third party that it could sort of cannibalize, one could cannibalize over the other? Is that right. any? So we're very careful in curating our outside brands, right? So we look for uniqueness, uh, we look for brand strength, we look for that strength that we don't think we would have or want to build, right? You look at Crocs, for example, what a great brand mm -hmm. and what a unique position in the market, right? Yeah. It's not one that we believe that many people, let alone us, can take over. Yeah. So we, and we also know our consumer loves Crocs. So we definitely want to bring brands like that and curate it. Fitflop, another unique brand, right? right? With a great uh, ergonomic fit that people love. We bought that and though it's, you know, 7,000 rupees for, for one yeah. of the sandals, but you know, it works. People mm -hmm. love it because it works. So you can notice we curate these brands. It's not something we would bring in that we're already doing or we can do well. We bring in brands with unique, unique points of view. So we don't believe there's going to be much cannibalism because we don't let them in through the door unless there's a unique point of view. Got it. Each one has their own USP. Correct. Any other concerns that the company or the footwear industry is currently grappling with? Any sort of... Uh, you know, issues that you think need to be addressed at the moment? Well, I think there's always issues, right? I think there's always, uh, we can always be a little bit more open on, on some of our policies and procedures, right? Uh, all the way down to labeling, which I think, you know, for example, labels are, um, w were designed to be done when we had CST and Octroi and things like that, right. right? Today with GST, it doesn't matter what the label says as long as you're capturing the end of the last sale, right? right? And so you can do price changes, right? Once you got it, because people were afraid you would play with Octroys and CSTs, which I'm true, I'm sure happened. I think we need to update, look, take a relook at some of these policies we have in place and say, is it really relevant? Does it prevent what it was intended to do mm -hmm. uh, when we didn't have GST, when we didn't have those things? And can we update it? Because the more easy you make it for business to do business, the more business business does, <laughs> right? So, uh, and I think that's something that we, we've got, to, it's, an, it's an evolution. Right. I, I think the officials are working diligently at trying to make it more and more. Yeah. I think the ONDC, which is the one digital shop, I don't know if you're aware of this. It's a big initiative by the government. I think it's going to be a game changer because it's going to put more and more people online. Right. While we're excited about it, we're not overly worried about it because one thing we've noticed is you need brick and mortar and you need online yeah. to be a good brand. Right. So that omni-channel strategy exactly. works well. And I understand that you, uh, Metro Brands has a relationship with its Karigars for many years and that's how you guys operate and manufacture. Just just take us through you know, some of the Absolutely. intricacies because we don't know anything on <laughs> well, that. Well, it Avan, it's been mind-boggling for me to find out about it. Right? Okay. As you know, I've been here a little over a year. Yes. We have over 250 Karigars out there mm -hmm. that supply Metro Brands. Yeah. And some of these go back three years, three generations wow. with, with the Malik family and the, the other side of the business. And this is deep relationships. And it really enables us to leverage their knowledge, their capabilities to the benefit of our customers. Mm. Because we're able to, to tweak designs, we're able to come out with designs, we're able to quickly react to things happening because we have this deep supplier base. Now, if you, were a, if you were a big four consultant, you'd walk in and say, hey, I know how to cut your supply base in half and save your costs and things like that. Yeah. I think what a lot of companies miss is, you know, there's a big difference between a store in Gorakhpur yeah. 
yeah. versus Ghatkopar right. versus you know G Ganganagar. Right. right. So now the question is, how do you cater to those customers in right. those markets uniquely? Mm. And that's where having a 250 vendor base comes in handy. So I'm sure a lot of shareholders as well are pleased with the kind of returns that they've made on uh, Metro brands. Do you monitor the stock price whatsoever? You know, I look at it uh, off and on. every so often. Right. Um, it, I think what, they, what the shareholder wants me to do is not look at the stock price, but look at my job <laughs> and make sure I'm doing my job right, correct? So. And I think you are so far, so any message to your shareholders? No, I think we, we thank them all for their support. They, you know, it shows a belief in us. Uh, when people open up their wallets for you, I think it's the ultimate uh, belief, and I think we're very grateful. We have a good set of uh, uh, good long-term investors as well, and of course, Rare, the Rare, founda the Rare uh, company has yes. been big partners with us. So we're excited and we think Metro has a great stable future that we plan on building and we'll, we keep working at it. And uh, since we're in this store, I'm eyeing some Crocs, I see some lovely bags and Modri's. Do you have any favorites, any particular in-house brands I have to ask within Metro that you, know, you like? I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about a very unique brand we have, which is Chimo. Okay. Right? Yeah. Chimo is a very high-end ladies' handbag range that we have. Okay. And the reason I love this brand is because it brings together what makes India unique. It's, yeah. it's done by Indian craftsmen. It, uh -huh. Each piece is handmade, so it's, it's unique. Right. Uh, I think, and it's, it, it's a piece of art. Right. Every one of them is a piece of art, right? And we bring it to where it's at an affordable price, yeah. but people are getting a premium product. So I, I just love watching our Chimo products and, and uh, enjoy it. Now, that sounds weird that I've chosen <laughs> a, a handbag, but we also yeah. have shoes that go with it. Oh, you know? okay. Of course we would. We're yeah. a shoe company, exactly. right? Exactly. But I think that's a unique thing. But I think that embodies our... our it also um, is a complement to our Carriger network, is a complement to our yes. consumers that trust us with these kind of products. So I think it embodies a lot when I look at that. Okay, and it's so interesting to hear about the ins and outs about how the business works, the financial metrics as well as your guidance. So thank you so much, Mr. Joseph, for taking time. Thanks very much, Ewan. Nice you. to meet you. Likewise.